can take all them sayer notes and just straighten them right out in heaven, aren't you? If you would turn with me, please, the book of Joshua, chapter number three. Joshua, let's start at chapter four. We're going to be bouncing back between Joshua three and four, and we're going to preach a message this morning, kind of along the line of the holiday that it is, and uh, we'll be preaching a, a message this morning called the Memorial of the Twelve Stones, the Memorial of the Twelve Stones, Joshua chapter four. Let's begin. Memorial Day, or any memorial, is established to remind us of a person or a, an event that has taken place that we really don't need to forget. Memorial Day honors those who gave their lives on the battlefield. Now, I remember, and I've told you this story, I think, before. I remember when I was a kid going up in my grandmother's, uh, she had a story and a half Cape Cod-style farmhouse, and I remember going up into the back bedroom of that old house that my grandfather built many years ago. And in the back bedroom was a little door into the attic, and us kids were always slipping around in, and going places, you know, where kids aren't supposed to go. And we slipped into that little attic, and in it was a footlocker, an army footlocker of the son that my grandmother had killed in World War II. He hit the beaches on Normandy, and uh, they, they actually blew his head off as he hit the beaches there on Normandy. And in that we opened, we found that footlocker, but there was something, even as just 10, 11 year old children, we realized there was something reverent about that. And we reverently opened that footlocker, and in it was his uniform, his hat, uh, his medals, and uh, the flag was folded that draped his coffin. But really, the thing that even as a child uh, impacted me the most as a child was the telegrams that he had sent home to his mother. If you've never seen a telegram from older days, they're a little bit bigger than a post-it note. And on that telegram was just a few words of, Mom, I love you, I'm in this, this, this. And it was just, and you, you know, you have to feel the pain of a parent, not just the soldier who gave his life or her life, but the pain of a parent who gave up a child to uh, the armed services to keep us free. And I'm grateful for those soldiers who died. I'm grateful for our Savior who gave his life on the cross of Calvary that we might have freedom. Praise God for freedom today. We, we're here because blood was shed on the battlefield, but we're here because blood was shed on the cross. And what a blessing that our Savior, praise God, he was not defeated on the cross, but he is alive forevermore. Amen. We're going to study this morning of, of the crossing of the Jordan River. You hear a lot of preaching on the crossing of the Red Sea, but the Jordan River parallels that same crossing, and that's what we want to study this morning. Joshua chapter number 4, and let's begin reading verse number 5 through 7. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over. Before the ark of the Lord, Joshua chapter 4, verse number 5, into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it came, when it passed over Jordan. The waters are, of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. They had a memorial day just as we do. Their memorial day was a little different. We want to study that this morning. Father, we pray now that you'd help us to put aside all worldly thoughts, that you'd help us to put aside all distractions, that we would uh, focus now on the precious Word of God. I pray the Spirit of God would continue to minister to us through the Word of God. Thank you for coming by this morning. We've already felt your presence. We know you're here. Now I pray that that same Spirit would just lift out the Word of God and seal it to our hearts as we study this morning together. In Jesus' name, amen. Moses had brought the people out of Egypt. 
He got to the point of the Red Sea. The Red Sea was before them. The Pharaoh and his armies were behind them. And God, you know the story, parted the Red Sea. And the people walked over on dry ground. They crossed. They were heading to the promised land. Where God, and the reason we call it the promised land, God promised them that they could have a place, that a land that flowed with milk and honey. And as they, it was an 11-day journey across the Sinai Desert straight to the promised land. 11 days is all it was. But God routed them south down the Sinai Peninsula and down to Mount Sinai. During that time, he gave them the Ark of the Covenant. They were to carry the Ark of the Covenant, and he gave them, gave them the uh, uh, tabernacle. And so they were to carry these things, and they were to worship these things, and so he takes them all the way down through the Sinai Peninsula, and for two years, they're there. They learn to work together, they learn to worship together, they learn to fight together, and they learn a lot of things. And so they come together as a people. And God brings them back up the Sinai Peninsula and brings them to the Jordan River where we are in our studies. And uh, they spent two years on an 11-day journey. God let them take two years to prepare for Kadesh Barnea. And that's where they are at Kadesh Barnea. And uh, uh, God is telling them to go ahead and pass over Jordan. But I want you to notice that in that day, uh, they uh, sent in 12 spies. And the 12 spies came back and said, oh boy, there's giants over there, there's walls over there, there's chariots of iron over there, and we can't go. And uh, 10 of those spies said, we can't go, and two of them, Joshua and Caleb, you know the story, said, yeah, we need to go, God's going to give it to us, we're going to be victorious. And they did not cross over, and for 38 more years, which was a total of 40, they wandered in the desert. They never strayed far from that point of time. For the next 38 years, they stalled at Kadesh Barnea. But now in our story, Joshua has led them to the place where they are to cross. And uh, I want you to notice here in Joshua chapter 3, turn back with me to Joshua chapter 3, and verse Verses 1 through 4. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. And he and all the children uh, of Israel, and they lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near to it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. Watch this next phrase. For ye have not passed this way before. They were facing a problem that they had never faced before. And I want to give you, if you ever write down one of my outlines, I want you to take a pen and a piece of paper this morning and write it down. Write down your Bible. Write it down anywhere. Get you a piece. Write down on your hand, praise God. I want you to, number one, these are all alliterated. I want you to, number one, know before you can have a memorial, before you can build a memorial, before you can go on in life, you have to face the problem. Number one, face the problem. Listen, our society that we live in today loves to turn from the problem. Amen, preacher. We love to shirk our responsibility. We do not want to face our problem. We do not want to face our duties. We do not want to face our responsibilities. That's why ladies abort babies. They don't want to face the responsibility. They don't want the problem of a child. That's why people use drugs and substance and alcohol. Amen. Because they don't want to face the problem. Christian, God has placed in you the spirit of the living God and he's given you the power to face any problem that comes in your life. Do not shirk it. Amen. Face the problem. And listen, nobody wants to raise a memorial to their failures. This is a memorial that Joshua is raising as they gather 12 stones out of the Jordan River. This is a memorial to say, hey, we've come through the river. We've come through the problem. We've faced the problem, and we have been successful. Hey, raise some memorials to your successes, praise God. Satan will build enough memorials to your failures. 
I promise you he'll build. He won't let you forget when you failed. He won't let you forget when you did wrong. He won't let you forget when you sinned. So Christian, you better build some memorials when you succeed. Amen. And so... Uh, we find that they come to the Jordan River. I want you to understand now, the Jordan, we'll read it in a minute, the Jordan had overflowed its banks. The Jordan was about a mile wide when they came to it. It was overflowing its banks in the time of harvest. And you know what? A lot of people get to that problem in their life. They find that they're facing this problem, and they get this victim mentality. Most people walk up to the Jordan River. It's overflowing its banks. They know they need to be on the other side, living that spirit-filled life. And they look, and they say, boy, this is just my luck, you know. I mean, the Lord's been leading me, and he's brought me here, and now I'm just stuck. Just the victim, poor little pitiful me. I can't face the problem anymore. God's not bigger than this river. Hey, I got news for you. God is the one that controlled the rainfall that made the Jordan River swell. God is the one that led the children of Israel up to that swollen river knowing that he caused the rainfall to bring them there. You know what that is? That's divine providence. Amen. So don't get to the Jordan River and say, that's just my luck. Hey, friend, there's a divine power that's led you to this place today. That's deep, ain't it? It's more than we can grasp, ain't it? Hey, but there's a divine power that's got you where you are today. Hey, it's not just a, a thing of luck. It's not just a thing of coincidence. God has given you his providence and his divine power to get you here today. You have a divine appointment. Jehovah God had led them to this place in a pillar of, uh, in a cloud and in a pillar of fire. And he had brought them to that place for that specific time to do a specific miracle through them. And Christian, he'll bring you to the same place. Uh, and you know what? Don't, work, don't turn your back on the problem and say, well, you know, God, I've seen so many Christians quit, praise God. Listen, they get to a certain point and it's like God's led them to the most difficult point in their life and they stop and they quit and they go home, take their marbles and go to the house. Praise God, he's big enough to, to, to if he's big enough to split the Red Sea, he's big enough to split the Jordan River. Right. Right. Amen. There's a higher power. And the Bible says here, you've not passed this way before. Yeah, you've come out of Egypt. You've crossed the Red Sea. You've been in the desert. You've seen all these things. But now there's a new series of events that's about to happen to you. Hey, Christian, there may be this very week, there may be a new series of events that come into your life that you were totally unprepared for. Amen. This is not just a memorial. And, and he tells them, listen, this is new ground. This is a new series of events. Hey, and he says, go through and gather up these stones and put them on the other side for a memorial. This is not just a memorial of something that happened. This was a memorial to refer to it, to look to the future. And when things go on in your life and God brings you through it, hey, raise up that memorial and don't just look at it and say, well, God did that then. That's not the purpose of the memorial to say God did it then. It's the purpose of the memorial is to say he'll do it again, praise God. I'm about to get excited. Yes, sir. How many times have you seen him work in your life? Listen, life is constantly changing. Life constantly causes us to walk on new ground. Face tomorrow. Christian, you can face tomorrow in one of two ways. It's your choice. You can face it full of anxiety and fear, or you can face it with faith and confidence. I got news for you. We study prophecy here. We love, I love prophecy. And we study it deep on it, and it scares us to death sometimes. But I got news. The reason we study prophecy is because Jesus said, when you see these things come to pass, lift up your head, because your redemption draweth nigh. He doesn't give us prophecy to scare us into building bunkers. He gives us prophecy to scare us into getting right with God. You say, to scare us? Yeah, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Yes, sir. And so, listen, you can have the victim mentality when you get to the Jordan River. You know what you can say? Forget that, oh, I know he brought us across the Red Sea, but, you know, that was 40 years ago. God's changed a lot. No, he hasn't. My God changes not. The world may change him, try to change him. The church may misrepresent him. 
but he's still the same God. <laughs> you can have the victim mentality. You know what the victim mentality will say to Jordan River? Well, the river's a mile wide. It's too deep. We can't cross. There's giants on the other side. You know what the devil does? Let me give you something, young people. Praise God. The devil likes to exaggerate. He don't, listen, he don't just plain out lie. He likes to exaggerate. So you know what they say? Well, the devil will say, when you reach the Jordan River, I'm talking about problems in your life. He'll say, well, you know, it's two miles wide. It's 400 feet deep. And the giants on the other side, we're, you're as grace hoppers in their sight. Well, that ain't so. If they would have been as grace hoppers uh, compared to a giant, that person would have had to be 100 foot tall. You know what the devil's doing? He's exaggerating. You know what they said? Oh, the victim mentality says we can't cross over because the giants are 100 feet tall. No, they're not. They're about 10, 15. Well, okay. Well, we can't cross over because they got chariots of iron. Fire-breathing chariots of iron. No, the devil's exaggerating. No, listen, nothing's ever as bad as it seems. And the devil wants to paint one of those big pictures, you know, it's just exaggerate, create a lot of drama. Boy, oh boy, I've raised three teenagers and there's a lot of drama in their life. <laughs> the devil wants to create drama. Amen? And uh, it's always going to go on. But hey, God comforts. God assures. God gives divine wisdom. God gives a steady, steadfast walk right through the midst of all the drama. And so the devil's creating all this drama. He says, oh, there's giants over there, 100 feet tall. <laughs> there are chariots of iron. And the walls. Now, you can read it in the Bible. I'm not, I'm not making this up. The Bible says that they thought the walls, they said the walls reached to heaven. Well, for Pete's sake. Y'all believe, you know, they didn't reach to heaven. They were big. Amen. They were formidable, but they didn't reach to heaven. The devil's exaggerating. Hey, God calms, God assures. Let me remind you of something. If God brings you to it, he'll bring you through it. He's never had a problem that he could not solve. Are you afraid to do greater things? You say, preacher, what kind of question is that? It's a very good one. Are you afraid of success? You know what? I'll be honest with you. Somebody would say, oh, that's a dumb question. You know what? I think a lot of us, and I said us, I think a lot of us are afraid to step out and do greater things. Amen. Got quiet, didn't it? You know why? It's hitting home. Hey. You and God are a majority. It doesn't take the church. You plus God are the majority. Amen. It doesn't take, listen, it doesn't take a great big intellect. It doesn't take a great big mind. It doesn't take a lot of skill and a lot of talent. It takes following the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're hooked into him, you have all the resources you need. I don't care if you're uneducated, you have resources in him. I know preachers that couldn't even read, and God called them to preach. They'd never been to school, and they learned to read their Bible. God can do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. You can have the victim mentality or you can have the victor mentality. The victor mentality says we're at the Jordan River, but this is just a new chapter of life. We can face the challenge. We can do whatever God's called us to do. He's going to open the doors. He's going to make the way. Hey, it's like buying a new house and going in it for the first time. Praise God. There's a new chapter in your life that's opening up. Go through the door and do the best you can for the glory of God. Amen. Don't fear to be successful and don't fear to do greater things. There's nothing that we face that our forefathers did not face. The devil will tell you, you're the first one to come here. You, you didn't know what our scripture said? You've not passed this way before? But they weren't the first ones to face the waters. Their fathers had, while they were in the bellies of their mothers 40 years earlier, they had already crossed the Red Sea. Now they didn't see it, 
But they were told about it over and over and over and over. They weren't the first one to face these waters. They may not have been that way before, but the same God that came through the Red Sea would take them through the Jordan River. Amen. And so we find that none of these people except Joshua and Caleb had seen the Red Sea crossing. What about now, Christian? Is there demands on your faith? Is something taxing you and causing anxiety in your life, in your spirit? This may be a new path for you. You may, have to, you may have to face death. You may have to face a loved one not being there anymore. You may have to face the problems and trials on the job. You may face job loss and financial insecurity. You may face all these things. But it's not a new path for you. It may be a new path for you, but it's not a new path for God. He's already been there. I'll guarantee you, if you look around in your troubles and in your trials, you'll see the bloody footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. You'll see that He's already walked this way. Hey, He's already walked this way so much that they crucified Him, they nailed Him to a cross, and the weight of the cross was a bloody way, and wherever you go, you'll find the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ leading the way. All right, I've got to hurry. That's just point one, my goodness. <laughs> Leave the wilderness of sin and cross over Jordan. Number two, number one, we faced the problem. I may have to split this up till next week. Number one, we faced the problem. Number two, find the power. Let's read chapter three and verse number eight. And we'll go through verse number 11. Chapter three. Verse number 8. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, don't look. Now let's watch where that word behold is injected here. Don't look at all the Hivites, Canaanites, Perizzites, and all them ites over there. You look at the Ark of the Covenant, verse number 11. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over you into, before you, into Jordan, praise God. Listen, when you come to the crossing of the Jordan River, and you look over, and you say, well, the river's wide, the river's deep, and there over on the other side is all them ites. Hey, there's always going to be ites out there. There's always going to be isms out there. Hey, don't get your eyes on the false. Get your eyes on the true God. Get your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Get your eyes on the Ark of the Covenant. You see, the Ark of the Covenant was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, watch this, and I'll give you that in just a moment, but let's put that aside for just now. Listen. He said, when you see the Ark of the Covenant and the priests that bear it, and they walk out in front of you, as quick as they touch the Jordan River, it's going to dry up. Boy, that took a lot of faith. You know who it took more faith in? I want to I hit somebody this morning. I want to hit us. I want to hit leaders. Brian, me, deacons, Sunday school teachers. You know what? The leaders, the Levites who bear the ark, they had to go out first and put their feet in the Jordan River. You know when this church will be successful? When the leaders of this church beginning right there. Amen. I'm preaching to the preacher. When the preacher gets his heart right and gets his spirit right and gets his soul right and preaches the word of God right and leads this church right, hey, something will happen. Amen. But not just the preacher, but the leadership of the church. These were Levites who bear the ark. Hey, they had to, have the, they had to accept the challenge, deacons. They had to accept the challenge, Sunday school teachers. They had to accept the new road that was before them, and they had to do it by faith, by following the ark, which was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. If this pastor and this deacon board and all the leaders of this church are following the Lord Jesus Christ, hey, you'd be best to get on board. Amen. And if we're not, then don't follow me. If I'm not following the Lord Jesus, put me out of here. Amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. Hey, 
Hey, we ought to be behind the ark. Now listen, watch this. The ark was normally carried in the middle of the Israelites. You had the uh, three tribes and three tribes and three tribes on each side. And then the, Le and then the Levites right in the middle. But this particular time, God says, no, don't leave it in the middle. This is the only time in 40 years they'd ever done this. And God said, bring that ark out and lead it out first and put it into the waters. That's something new. That was, something, that was a new type of leadership for them. They weren't really familiar with that. They were, they'd never seen that before. But God said to do it, so we're going to do it. You know what you got to do sometimes? You just got to get on board with what he's doing. May I remind us that he has the divine wisdom, the divine providence to lead us and guide us into ways. Hey, we've never been here before. But praise God, through the grace and the glory and the majesty of God, we will press on. And so uh, I want you to see this. And he, said, and he said, listen, when you see the Levites stepping there, don't get ahead of them. Don't, now, don't miss this point. Don't get ahead of them and try to run around them and swim the Jordan. Wait till they step in, then you're going to see something happen. That's the whole point of what's going on here. And so these Levites, they walk out by faith. They, their feet touches the water and boom, the water hearts. Why? Because they had the faith to step in first. Amen. Don't you know that some of them was going, <laughs> oh boy, what if we step in and nothing happens? Hmm, what are we going to do then? What, what, if, what if God, what, what if Joshua was wrong? Oh, what, oh, there's a million questions that you could ask, but hey, listen, when they stepped in the water's part, so don't get ahead of God. Don't get ahead of the ark. And uh, so they patiently waited. Let me say that again. Let me say something again. God will give us the patience to face our problems. And God, number two, will let us find the power. The power for you, Christian, that's the second point. Find the power. Face the problem. Find the power. The, God will give you the power, listen, through the Lord Jesus Christ to face every problem. I got a problem with a lot of preachers who preach messages like I'm preaching this morning, and they never mention the blood. They never mention the cross. They never mention the Lord Jesus Christ. They never mention the way of salvation. Hey, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you don't have the power. You don't have the Spirit. Hey, get with the Lord Jesus. See, the ark was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, how was that? Well, the ark had two staves. It was a box about two foot square. And uh, it was a box that was made out of acacia wood and covered with gold. That acacia wood was a type of the humanity of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ was human. He was completely human. He was tempted as, in all points like, as, like we are. Hey, and, but it was covered with gold. That's his deity. He was all God, but he was all man. Hey, he was 100% human, but he was 100% divine. I don't understand it. I can't explain it. But the ark was a type of that. The ark was carried by two staves that went through four rings. There were four, one ring on each corner, and two staves were run through those rings. Those two staves are a type of the cross. Listen, you can't cross the Jordan without the cross of Calvary. You know what the Jordan River and, and passing over into the promised land is? It's not death. We hear a lot of songs that say, uh, I'm just going to cross over Jordan one of these days, you know. That's a type of death and going to heaven. That's not the scripture. I mean, that's okay to use it like that. But the scripture really crossing over Jordan and entering into the promised land is a type of, not a type of death, but it is a type of a Christian living a spirit-filled life. You know what's wrong with most of us? We are sitting on this side of Jordan in Kadesh Barnea, mumbling and grumbling and going on. Hey, got a mustache here in my mouth. Pardon me. <laughs> hey, move on across. Move on across and live a spirit-filled life. Don't get quiet on me. Move on across and live a spirit-filled life. Life. It's wonderful. It's joyous. There's peace. There's contentment. Listen, there's tranquility. 
There's less anxiety. Yeah, there's some giants over there, and yeah, there are some chariots of iron, and yes, there are some walls, and yes, there are some problems, but I'd rather be on that side of Jordan with the Lord Jesus Christ than on the desert side living in sin. Glory. So, without the cross, you won't cross over. You need to find the power. I'm closing the message. I'm pumped up. Listen, I can preach two more hours, but I know it's Memorial Day. The ark was a type of the Savior. The staves were a type of the cross. The rings were a type. The four rings were a type of the four piercings. They pierced his hands. They pierced his feet. And so when the Israelites were, this was not just some old box that the Israelites carried through the wilderness wanderings. This was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, if it's written in this book, it's holy. Amen. Don't, just, don't just look and say, well, they just carried an old box. No, they didn't. They carried something that was a type of our Savior. That's holy. And so we find that the ark had its staves, it had its rings, it was acacia wood, inside it, it was golden, in, uh, a.k.a. acacia wood on the inside, gold on the outside. And then inside of it was the law of God. Those tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai was inside of that ark. You know what that's a type of? That's a type of the law. Now guess what the law does? The law, when I read the law, I find myself guilty before God. I am a sinner. George Jesse, number one, is a sinner. And a person that does not face that will never be saved. We got churches full of people who call themselves Christians who've never repented, saw themselves lost, been under conviction of the Holy Ghost, and they're lost as a blind goose in a hailstorm. Amen, preacher. So the law was inside of that uh, Ark of the Covenant. But on top of that was something called the mercy seat. And on that mercy seat... God told the high priest to go in with the blood and sprinkle it on that mercy seat over top of that law. So God, when we break the law that's on the inside of the covenant, and God has to judge us as unrighteous and send us to a devil's hell, he can now look down and instead of seeing the law, he sees that mercy seat covered with blood. Amen. Glory. And, and so when he sees the blood... He's not going to see me as lost if the blood's applied. He's not going to see me as lost. He's not going to see me as unworthy. He's going to see me as his child through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to run. Amen. Miss Armour, you better move that wheelchair. I'm about ready to have a fit. <laughs> Amen. So thank God for the blood. Well, number one, find the power. Face the problem. Number two, find the power. Now close. When God brings you to the Jordan, I can't believe I just preached two points, but that's all I got. Listen, same time next week, I'll preach the rest of this message of God willing. If you want the other three points, they just get better. Praise God. I'll bring my tennis shoes next week. <laughs> and listen, when God brings you to something, Maybe he's breaking the rut you're in. Christians, we get in a rut. Tell me we don't. I said we. And you know what we do? You know what makes a rut? You ever seen a horse hooked to a, let's say, a, a molasses mill? And it just goes around and around and around and around and around, or a grist mill. And you know what the next thing it is? It's done wore the grass out, then down in through the topsoil, and that horse is in a rut. You ever tried to get a, Brother Dickie probably knows, you ever tried to get a horse out of a rut? They don't, I mean, they get used to something, they get habituated to something, and you know what you've got to do? You've got to lay the spurs to them. You know what God does some to us sometimes? That ain't popular, but he gets us out of a rut. He makes us face a new challenge. Hey, to get, listen, I don't want to grind somebody else's corn. 
If God's got to move me to get me out of my rut, I don't, listen, what a, a boring life to just go round and around something, you know, grinding somebody else's corn. I like a pretty good challenge every once in a while. Amen? Hey, and God was challenging these people to have the faith to move over. Moses at the Red Sea raised his staff and the Red Sea parted. But Joshua said, take the priests and the ark on in the water. Let's see what happens. You know what you got to do sometimes? You just got to say, we're going to step out by faith and let's see what happens. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.18, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of his glory, of, the inheritance in, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Christian, there may be a desert behind you, but there's a promised land in front of you. <laughs> there may be a landscape of barrenness behind you. Move, cross on over. You know, rivers oftentimes divide landscapes. Let me give you an example. In, in our area, the Clinch River runs. And on one side of the Clinch River, there's no coal, none. And you can take one step on the other side of the Clinch River and you can be so rich in black gold it ain't even funny. People have been made millionaires because of what's on the other side of that river. You know what, t t this morning, Christian? You're a millionaire and most of us act like we're living in poverty. I'm talking about spiritual. I ain't talking about money or gold or success or material things. I'm talking about spiritually. Why do we live in spiritual poverty? Why do we live as victims? Why do we live and never tap? God has the resources for us to live victorious. Why do we not tap into it? There's a desert behind. Jesus said, find the power. <laughs> All power is given to me in heaven and earth, he said. He told the Pharisees, he said, you don't know the power of God because you don't know the scripture. Ouch. You know what, folks? I'm afraid that a lot of us don't know the power of God because we don't know the Scripture. Get in it on a daily basis. Don't just get in it to church. Don't just bring your Bible. Hey, get in this book. I've seen people get in this book, and I've watched them grow as they became stronger and stronger and stronger and claim the promises of God. There is power of God is in the blood, but it's in the book, praise God. There's power to forgive, and I'm closing. Face the problem and find the power. There's power to forgive. Do you need forgiveness this morning? Jesus Christ can forgive. Power to forgive, power to heal. Do you need healing? There's power to heal. There's power against unclean spirits. There's the power of the sovereign, the savior, the scriptures, the spirit, the supernatural. You know what the book says? And I'm going to quote it and close. The Bible says, now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now get that. Not just above. How do you like that? <laughs> Not just above, but exceedingly abundantly above. Higher than I can raise my Bible. Listen. Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or that we think according to, don't miss this, the power that worketh in us. I didn't say the power that was on the throne. It's there. I didn't say the power that's in heaven. I didn't say the power of the air. The power that's in us. If you're saved this morning, the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of you and can empower you to live a holy life make the right decisions, glorify God, and be used for the glory of God. And then one day, you'll get to cross the Jordan River, praise God, and that spirit-filled life, the blessings of God will just flow. Amen. Amen. I'm through preaching. Lisa, come to the piano. That's two points. Be back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel, praise God.
The next point will be to follow the providence of God. Let's all stand. I'm through preaching. Thank you for your attention.